Welcome to America's Heroes Group. Good afternoon and welcome to America's Heroes Group's Roundtable, Legally Speaking, with Steve and Cliff. February is Black uh, History and American Heart Month. It's February 26, 2022. I am co-founder, Vietnam veteran, and host, Cliff Kelly. Hi, and I'm his co-host, that golden voice of Cliff Kelly is in mm -hmm. the studio. And I'm Colonel Dr. Damon Arnold. Uh, executive producer Glenda Smith is here, as well as our digital media producer and iconic Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. Uh, today's topic, uh, we actually have someone on the phone, a stranger to nobody, who's in the legal profession. And uh, I wish he was uh, the nominee for the Supreme Court myself. He's such <laughs> a great, such so a great attorney. Yeah. Uh, but Steve J. Seidman, uh, founding attorney of Seidman Law Office, with over 30 years as an experienced trial lawyer focused on personal injury, Steve is America's Heroes Group partner, sponsor, and advisory board member. Uh, he is fantastic. So he's going to give us updates on the legal issues of today. How are you doing, Steve? I'm fine. How are you, Governor and Doctor? How you doing? Good, fine, good. Consular. <laughs> good to uh, good to hear your voices. And, um, and well, you too. Yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, because of, uh, you know, it's it's Black History Month. I I thought I'd spend some time with what's wrong uh, right now with uh, things uh, for veterans and for military personnel with regard to racism. Yeah. And um, we've we've tackled a lot of issues legally. Over the years, um, us, uh, all, all of us, um, uh, your executive producer, Glenda Smith, was very instrumental in um, uh, getting sexual discrimination uh, and changes in the military. We've talked about all kinds of things through the years, but we're still bogged down in some pretty terrible um, situations with racism. And just this week, uh, the military uh, uh, military publications came out with a survey uh, that said that many service members of color are turning down assignments because of concerns about racism. And in fact, uh, unfortunately, there was a survey that showed that 42% of service members of color uh, in a new survey turned down an assignment of, and or asked for a permanent change of station order because of concerns about racism and discrimination, even if they knew that it can negatively affect their career. And, you know, we shouldn't be surprised at this because this is sort of part of our daily uh, living, uh, the systemic racism. Uh, I bring it uh, because of the Super Bowl being over now, but we know that uh, former head coach Brian Flores filed a lawsuit against the NFL for alleged racial discrimination. Um, and uh, actually, at one point, there were three African-American coaches. Then there was, the, after the season, there were one, and I think Lovey Smith was hired now with Houston, so that would be the second. But um, uh, there's systemic racism that uh, Coach Flores has identified and brought a class action suit for, uh, and we could see that in the military, this is kind of a pervasive situation uh, for people of color. And uh, the majority of service members seven, surveyed, about 79%, uh, even though they said that the military has had a positive influence on their professional growth and they feel respected by their peers, they, they many reported safety concerns, racial pro profiling by police, racial slurs, and other forms of discrimination. Um, and in fact, um, I looked through some things this week and found that um, uh, there were statistics that actually showed uh, that there were actual disparities uh, in military justice under the Uniform Military Code of Justice, and that's the legal code that governs the U.S. Armed Forces. Numerous studies, uh, including a report last year from the Government Accountability Office, showed black and Hispanic service members were disproportionately investigated and court-martialed. Uh, a, a recent Naval Postgraduate School study found that black Marines were convicted and punished a courts martial at a rate five times higher than other races across the Marine Corps. Um, and the uh, A 
AP did an investigation that showed the military's justice system had no explicit categories for hate crimes, uh, and something that 46 states and the District of Columbia have on the books, and it makes it difficult to quantify how many crimes are motivated, motivated, motivated by prejudice. This year, uh, actually late last year, President Biden um, at, it, it instituted a new National Defense Authorization Act, and it was uh, the act was to address uh, extreme violent extremism, uh, but it did not address hate crimes or racial disparities. And after January 5th of last year, the insurrection, uh, it was found out that in the military, uh, there were a lot of um, uh, commanders and a lot of people in the military, a lot of veterans that apparently were, were racist. And not only racist, they were uh, extremists. And uh, so they're now the military and uh, Lloyd, Oist, Lloyd, Lloyd Austin is going ahead and, and making rules about um, uh, kind of liking or uh, passing on Twitters or uh, negative comments that have to do with racism. And if you're in the military, you gotta you, you better start watching out because that's gonna no longer be tolerated. I also did some research and found that uh, racism uh, plagues the US military academies. And in fact, uh, beyond the blanket anti-discrimination policies, these federal funded institutions volunteer little about how they scream for extremists or hateful behavior or address the racial slates, racial slights that some graduates of color say they, they forced, they were forced with daily. I mean, some people were like, uh, noted to be called angry black men or, uh, they were repeatedly in trouble or being corrected for infractions that were not actually infractions. And it was a it was, some people said it was a deliberate choice to dig and to push on certain individuals compared with other cadets who were white cadets. So we see it in the uh, in the uh, one people not accepting assignments and moving bases right now because of racism. We see it in the military academies. We see it in the military code of justice. We see it in the NFL coaching the discrimination. And uh, then we talked about the uh, NFL concussion lawsuits. You remember we talked about how the race norming in the concussion lawsuit paid black men less money who had concussions than white men because they assumed in the study and in the class action that the black football players had a lesser IQ by virtue of being black than the white ones did. And that's now subject to class action. Uh, the concussion class action is now being revisited uh, for transparency, and they're they're going to redo uh, basically the whole thing. And then Dr. Arnold brought up, and I'd like to discuss more in detail, uh, where because both Cliff, I know you you fought in the Vietnam conflict, and, and uh, <clears throat> Dr. Arnold was in the uh, Afghanistan the Iraq uh, war, uh, and now the VA, the veterans who come out. Uh, of of these, in the, you know, after service, are finding that they're not getting disability um, uh, claims approved at the rate that white or or people who are not of color are getting approved at. And this started actually in 2017 with a a research pa paper, um, uh, and the research paper was by Jonathan Arnold. Uh, no uh, coincidence there at University of St. Thomas. And this, this gentleman found, he said that he, that, that he found through his previous research is that veterans do not receive equivalent service connection or disability status compared to their white counterparts. Now, where do we get into the law about this? Because we've talked about this before that there was a lawsuit filed by Yale and the Yale uh, people uh, filed a, it, on behalf of the Black Veterans Project and the National Veterans Com Council for Legal Redress. And that was filed last year, mid-2021. Uh, and what that particular lawsuit was meant to do was to address the widespread discrimination against across VA facilities and highlight that the VA has failed to address systemic racism and call into question whether the VA has been fairly administrating benefits to black veterans. 
VA, the lawsuit actually states, and I have it in my hand right now, that it's hidden, it's systemic racism and neglect from the public's view for too long, and historically has taken steps, a few, few steps to acknowledge and rectify the issue. And what this lawsuit did is, is to ask under the rules, what's called freedom of information, um, a bunch of records from the VA pursuant to the FOIA, the freedom of information, that shed, would shed light on the racial disparity against the VA system. And uh, they, they actually alleged uh, a pattern of discrimination against black veterans and statistically want to show uh, that, um, uh, that those who have served our country uh, are not being treated fairly by the color of their skin. And uh, the, the allegations of the lawsuit said, there's no reason to believe that the VA's healthcare system is immune from medical racism. In fact, several studies specifically examined the VA healthcare system and found that healthcare disparities persist between black and white patients, even when controlling for factors like economic status and outside insurance coverage. A significant proportion of black veterans re- perceive discriminations with the VA, low perceived quality of care, low satisfaction with their VA health care. Um, so what we're seeing is, is that racism at the VA uh, was revealed many times and even more clearly when it was discovered by several of the lawyers um, and administrative law judges who decided whether a particular veteran would receive benefit. And there was actually an email chain called the Forum of Hate. The email chain contained years of racist, sexist, and homophobic slurs. And they actually uh, uncovered that. And the VA historically has taken very few steps to acknowledge discrimination, to do anything about it. And and this lawsuit um, is, is hopefully going to address that. So next time I'm here, I'm hoping that I could get a, a current status of where the lawsuit is. But um, I'd just like to, to open it up to you, Dr. Arnold, especially, uh, if you could share maybe whether you had any instances of, uh, of, of what you saw in the claims, at least, part of this uh, oh, process. Oh, VA. oh, most definitely, Steve. And, you know, I'm actually coming up to my, uh, I think it's my third retirement. My wife is like, what's your next job? Uh, but that's in, on March, March 11th. But what I want to do is I'm going to actually reach out to you because I really want to work on this with you more closely uh, because it's really it, it's, it's stabbing in my heart uh, what's happening to people. And uh, one, one of the things that um, I was going to mention is the – I'm not sure if there's any statistics or people have looked at this particular issue, but when someone goes for a comp and pen exam, uh, the VA sets the p- comp and pen exam, and they've actually outsourced that to a couple of companies that uh, set these evaluations up. And what I've been experiencing is that you go to that comp and pen exam, and you talk to the person, and the person says, yes, I see everything here. It's in your records. Why didn't they do this for you, right? Why didn't they give this? So you know that there's going to be a p- proactive statement, which you never get. You never get a copy of that evaluation from the person that's doing the comp and pen exam, and then you get a letter in the mail that says, we have uh, sent this for an opinion outside. And it's like, that was the opinion you asked for. I didn't pick that person, you picked them. And I have to go for this exam, and the person's agreeing with it, so you're gonna keep getting opinions until you find one that says no. So I think that the whole process mm -hmm. is corrupt. (laughs) Yes, and, and and then you have to wonder, in comparison to the to people who are not of color, right. what the statistics are in that regard. Yes, exactly. So I, I would love to see something on that. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do for the next time is I'm going to contact these lawyers out of Yale. Uh, and actually, these, this lawsuit was brought uh, by uh, a, a bunch of Yale uh, student interns. Uh, there's a supervising attorney, a, attorneys. Uh, and it's it's from the Jerome Frank Legal Services Organization, Veterans Legal Services Clinic, Yale Law School. And uh, they're doing yeoman's work. And actually, they've identified uh, what is, I think you've seen probably, mm-hmm. um, that people of color are just not being treated fairly. And, and you got to wonder, if the evidence is there, why aren't they being uh, adjudicated um, uh, disabled? 
or given the benefits that someone who is of color, who is not of color, is given. Mm-hmm. And then you get back into this, this, this form of hate email chain right. that apparently contained years of racist, sexist, and homophobic slurs. And apparently it was, it was revealed yeah. uh, that the people who actually decide whether a particular veteran will receive benefits were part of this chain. So what does that tell you? Yeah. And, you know, one other thing, Steve, is like, you know, at least when I was in the combat zone, you know, in Iraq and I was, uh, you know, in uh, Kuwait and other uh, other places, what happens is a thing called a line of duty statement. And what that is, is if you get injured, they're supposed to do a medical statement or make some kind of uh, documentation of this injury that you incurred. And I did not see it happening for African-Americans. It was it was so terrible that people would not produce that record. So when you go for an evaluation, you come back home, you sit down in the VA office, and the doctor has their back to you. They speak to you for three minutes. And I'm a physician, so I know what they should be asking me. They don't. And they don't record what you're saying. And so what ends up happening is that you have a break in that that actual uh, incident, that thing that you went through, and any kind of claim that you subsequently bring up. And so the record documentation they keep asking you for, they're part of the problem. The institutional racism stopped them from even recording something happened to you to begin with. So my next question is, and we have about five or six minutes left, and I'm going to put you on the spot and and put Cliff on the spot. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to change this? I mean, we know it exists, okay? So the first step will be, you know, it went from 2017 with this, uh, this, this report that this individual did, and then it's coming now to this lawsuit, which I'm going to see if we can't maybe get somebody for our next show at least speak to. But the question is, what do we do next? The only way this gets changed, well, first of all, we know institutional racism, unfortunately. I'd like to put my head in the sand and say, okay, it's going to change. But the fact of the matter is, I, the older I get, the less I think, the less confidence I have in people that anything's going to change as far as uh, racism, anti-Semitism, and all of the other uh, hate groups. So how are we going to effectuate change? And that's the next couple of minutes I want to talk about. We, we know some congressmen, right? We saw, in fact, you mentioned the Supreme Court justice. What a great thing, because Representative Clyburn, I mean, let's face yes. it. He he basically uh, saved President Biden during the primary and basically took that ball and, and to, were across the goal line himself and said, we're going to have a, a, an African-American woman Supreme Court justice. And indeed, there is one nominated who is a tremendously qualified individual. Uh, but but how are we going to change this at the VA? So that's what I want to throw out there. Yeah, I, I think it takes uh, things that you're doing, the, 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 the Yale Law Center is doing, and, it, it, you know, it's like the best disinfectant is light, right? <laughs> so, you know, uh, shining a light on what has been going on and actually looking at the statistics, you know, data, 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 and, and making sure that people see that these numbers are real. And, uh, you know, you can't hide from facts, you know. Um, the data that you're talking about is really critical. I think it's really talking about these stories. And, and, and it's not just affecting African-American veterans. It's white veterans as well. It's, you know, it's our Asian veterans. It's women. You know, historically, they have been under, um, undercompensated across the board. But you do have a, a much higher incidence, like you were mentioning, you know, the, um, the impact on African-Americans as far as racism is five times more likely that you get reprimanded in the Marine Corps and those kinds of things. So I, I think it's really just bringing things into the light. That's what we had to do nationally when we started talking about uh, lynchings in the country. We talked about all kinds of civil rights movements, women's rights movements. It's, it's a rights movements for people who are the ones on the front line. And I get really tired of seeing people going and attacking our capital on January 6th. I, lo- I get tired of seeing things like Putin you know, trying to really uh, discriminate and, k- and kill people indiscriminately and children. And then when we start looking at that, we start getting to the point where we have people even in our own country, people who are on the news, who are commentators supporting the ideal that uh, Putin is a great leader. As even our former president, you know, was 
for, you know, saying that he's a great leader. How can we do that and still talk about being a democratic society that's just? Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, so if you can't change <coughs> the life course of those people who are serving in the military, who wear that uniform every day, we need to start thinking about this country again. And Cliff, has something. Yeah. Yeah. one thing yeah, you Steve, that I'm going to yeah. do is um, ask. Uh, Another guest we're going to have on is just a wonderful gentleman, uh, Congressman Danny Davis, and uh, he will be happy, I'm sure, to, to join our fight on this. Yeah. Well, that would be great, Cliff, and I think uh, uh, Ms. Smith actually, um, uh, you know, she, she was very active in the, in the sexual discrimination, and, and, and I think she wants to be active in this, too, and I think this is something that our group could do. And I think it's very important to all veterans. I think it's very important to all of us. And I think that unless things change, it's not going to change isn't going to happen by sitting still and doing nothing. It's going to happen by people doing things, and it has to start politically, just like all the other movements. And it's great that uh, uh, General Austin has started at the top, starting mandating things, but it has to be systemic, and, and everything has to, everything has to as, as Dr. Arnold said, the light has to shine deep and bright on all of this. Yes, yes. Yeah, because, I, you know, I mean, I, I literally almost cried when I got back from Iraq because I, I saw this one uh, inc one person. He was actually white. He lived as a farmer. He was down in southern Illinois, but he lost his legs and his arm, and his wife had to work three jobs to support him, and he had a heck of a battle with the VA trying to get the kind of services he needed. And he it, this debilitated him morally and mentally, not just physically, so we have to do mm -hmm. something about this. But we're running out of time, Steve, and we're getting ready to move on to another segment, but we have got to get you back on this. Uh, give me okay. your phone number, too. At, at, uh, so that, that 312 781 1977. 1977. Okay. 1977. Right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. Okay, stay with us. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. 